Welcome everybody, my name is Andrea Henderson and I'm Head of Engagement at Newcastle University um, and this is the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series and thank you for, for bearing with us there while we've got a few more people joining. This is the second um, of the KESS that we've done online as a webinar as opposed to a seminar so do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties but hopefully it'll all go smoothly. Um, I just want to say a huge thanks to Holly Ann Carl who organises the Knowledge Exchange series and you will have received emails from Holly Ann. Um, Holly can't actually be with us today as she's on a training course so Bob Allen is with us and thanks to Bob for stepping in and um, Bob will be chairing the Q&A session at the end. Um, so just as a, a reminder of sort of housekeeping it said on that holding slide as we were joining if we can just make sure that our um, video is off and our um, microphones are muted for the duration of the talk it just means that people can focus on what the speaker is saying. So just by way of introduction, I want to give you a little bit of background as to what the KESS is. Um, so the Newcastle University Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series aims to promote evidence-based policymaking um, by enabling researchers to present their findings to local decision makers. So this was a concept that was developed by Professor Sally Shortle um, with colleagues at Queen's University in Belfast. Um, and Sally is now an academic at Newcastle within our Centre for Rural Economy. The KESS itself is a partnership between the university and five local authorities, uh, along with the North East LEP and the Chamber of Commerce. So the idea is, is that we speak to these um, local authorities and the other organisations involved and ask them what are the key policy topics that they'd like to hear about. We take those topics and then we put them to our staff and say, what are your what research areas are you working in that would respond to these key issues and the result of that is one of these seminars so we've been doing this for a couple of years now last year we delivered um three seminars this year there has been um two face-to-face -face seminars before the current situation that we're in and now we've moved these to a webinar format and again thanks for doing that so um oh, just a reminder to keep our microphones muted <laughs> So that's what KESS is. Um, here's the upcoming programme. So we've got a couple of events coming up in June. I think you may have all had the programme from Holly before the meeting. If anyone hasn't got it, then we can send that out to all participants following today's session. So our speaker today is Gemma Mitchelson. And Gemma is going to be talking to us about um, her findings around mobile learning and virtual spaces, blurred lines of private and public space. So Gemma's talk will last around 30 minutes and following the talk then we'll have a Q&A session. If you have a look, you hover your, your mouse over your screen, at the bottom you should find a chat functionality. I think everyone's been kind of using it already just to say hello to each other. If you've got any questions at any point throughout Gemma's talk, you can just type them in the chat and Bob will be collating those and then we'll lead the Q&A session at the end. So just a reminder, microphones and videos off so we can all concentrate on Gemma's talk um, and we look forward to having some questions at the end but that's it from me so I'll hand over to Gemma. Thank you. Hello everybody thank you so much for joining me today I'm just going to switch to share my screen with you before we get started. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you to Andrea for that introduction. My name is Gemma Mitchelson, as she mentioned, and my seminar today is on mobile learning and virtual spaces, blurred lines of private and public space. Just a little disclaimer before we get started. What I'm discussing with you today is preliminary, and my aim is actually to develop this further with primary data collection as soon as our current and unusual um, circumstances and restrictions are lifted. So as I'm sure you agree, there are many acknowledged pedagogical benefits to use of personal mobile devices in the classroom. Initiatives such as tablets for schools advocate how some mobile devices encourage autonomy, collaboration, engagement and creativity, for example. And of course, there are wider institutional benefits if the device is provided by students themselves, such as reduced pressures on our PC clusters. So unsurprisingly, use your own device, 
also referred to as bring your own device, is becoming a common approach, specifically in higher education. So much so that some of the institutions, including Newcastle University, are allowing students to sit digital exams on their own devices via lockdown browser software. And whereas there is a level of comfort and familiarity offered through use of a personal mobile device, questions do arise around spatial privacy when the physical environment is blurred with the virtual. Being connected to the same device for all aspects of daily life, both private and public, can instigate downfalls when the two lose any divisive boundaries. So in today's seminar, I'll be talking more about preferred type of mobile devices, the boundaries of private and public space on such devices, and how we may approach this potential blurring of boundaries in an educational setting. And for the purposes of this presentation, I've defined the following key terms. So when I'm talking about mobile devices, I mean any device that can host educational applications and that allows access to internet search engines. So typically a tablet, a laptop or a mobile phone. When I'm referring to private space in this context, I'm talking about virtual connections to people, apps and activities that are not related to the classroom. So examples of what may procure this private space include text messages, emails and notifications from friends and family, event reminders, banking alerts, streak, streak updates, photographs, etc., etc. And when I'm referring to public space in this context, I'm referring to what falls into the boundary of classroom appropriate interactions with a mobile device. So examples of this may include dictionary use, use of a translator for international students, online class collaboration tools such as Quizlet, Padlet, sorry, um, connected quizzes. Use of a personal device publicly in a physical classroom setting may be either teacher or student led. So whilst this presentation is mainly focused on the idea of boundaries, it's important to note the research around device type. Many students prefer to use a mobile phone rather than a tablet for investigatory work in the classroom. But interestingly, these devices are banned at school level. So there's an expectation that undergraduate students particularly will simply adapt to using all types of mobile devices effectively when they come to university, but there appears no training in how to do so. Support around digital well-being does not appear to be part of the central induction process at university, for example. More internet browsing takes place via mobile phones than on laptop or desk computers. Yet, as I mentioned, this device type is often at the forefront of criticism with educational providers banning them completely in some cases. Such bans or such policies have not appeared at tertiary level, which is why there's a vast amount of research available on use of mobile phones in higher education especially for multitasking in the classroom. However, there does appear to be a lack of research on students' own choice of mobile device, and this choice may even change according to the chosen day, time or location of study. In higher education, a variety of mobile devices are used in lectures and seminars, but are they being used effectively and are they enhancing the learning experience? What we have at the moment are conflict in opinions amongst, amongst most staff and students surrounding the affordances of mobile devices in general. The bigger problem at all levels of education is not device type, but how to guide a student to use their personal device responsibly for educational purposes. The issues raised in this presentation are applicable to all mobile device types because multiplicity and synchronicity across personal devices means that any device can now serve the same purpose. Synchronizing devices means frequent and varying notifications appear, whichever device type is in use, whether you have got your tablet or your mobile phone connected. 
and it can mean that users are never switched off from either public or private connections. Yet it is unclear if connected students are consciously aware of this or even of spatial privacy with use your own device. We can posit the question of whether or not a learner manages to use their personal device for educational purposes when the device in use remains connected to non-educational distractions. In other words, is it easy to differentiate between public and private space? So moving on to the idea of boundaries. Technology allows us the luxury of mobility with time and space and is changing the society, societal perception of both. So according to Gantt and Kaysler, wireless technologies are enabling people to move so freely that the boundary of personal life and work or study in this case is blurred. Being connected virtually online to people in other spaces confuses social norms because we lose temporal cues that would be offered in person. So for example, one social norm would be to avoid disturbing somebody taking a class, but our virtual connections cannot differentiate easily between when it's appropriate to connect. Because wireless technologies are not tethered to specific places, we often don't know the location of the recipient and we can't moderate our own behaviour according to the norms of behaviour settings. Mobile technologies encourage an anytime, anywhere mentality with an expectation of speedy response, pressuring people to stay connected to their personal lives when at work or studying and vice versa. Often this has a detrimental effect on our mental well-being. So my own experiences recently of working from home, for example, I have found that I'm now habitually checking the Teams app that I've downloaded onto my mobile phone out of hours and often I don't even know why I'm doing it. So I initially added this app for a speedier connection, but I'm finding it's really uncomfortable now having it there visibly once I've switched off from work and once I'm using my phone socially. Prior to lockdown, I observed similar changes in classroom behaviours related to personal mobile devices. As I can see that students are more distracted than ever before. The temptations presented in having a personal device are easily observable. So from my own experience, I've observed students in, in my own um, guise as a student WhatsApp in each other while sat beside each other in a seminar group. I've seen students doing their online shopping in a lecture theatre. And I've observed students who have been very engaged in a class, but then as soon as a notification has popped up on their phone, they've lost focus for the remainder of the session. However, I've also witnessed students who make a conscious effort to manage their device by placing its screen down on the desk. We may question why they don't simply leave the device in their bag, but there is evidence to suggest that many people suffer from separation anxiety when it comes to a mobile device. Statistics to support this show that this was in 2013, 54% of UK smartphone users in a study self-reported suffering from nomophobia. And this term means the fear of losing or being without your phone at any given time, obsessively checking to make sure you have your phone with you and constantly worrying about losing it somewhere. Just to support this in an academic context, Ofqual, they published research findings for the last academic year and they concluded a 22% increase in the number of penalties given to students found with their mobile phone while sitting a GCSE or A-level examination. We might jump to the conclusion that those students had those mobile phones because they were trying to cheat. But actually, the report suggests that these statistics represent a trend of students suffering separation anxiety when away from their phone also. Because the mobile phone is the device most relied upon, it has the most value to students and it is the most likely to cause this separation anxiety. 
whether using a tablet, a mobile phone or an alternate mobile device, without learner training, it is challenging for many students to manage the multiplicity presented to them on their chosen device. Being connected to an educational app or Googling information for a classroom task means being connected to all of the features that the device is associated with and being connected to family, friends and partners too. So another associated issue connected to a person's mobile device is that of FOMO or fear of missing out. And this was a term coined by Shabilsky. Suffering from FOMO or other related conditions causes real physical symptoms, including anxiety, sweating and increased heart rate. For many, this fear of missing out occurs in group messaging to plan activities, in gossip streams released on social media, and during many other rapid decision-making processes that take place virtually. Being connected anytime, anywhere creates an expectation of instantaneous responses. And now we've got features such as read notifications, which really pressurize the recipient to reply for fear of being accused of ignoring the sender. And such interactions become addictive and this impacts upon educational achievements. It's shown that the higher the degree of mobile phone addiction, the greater the likelihood that students' academic performance will decline. Being constantly connected to any mobile device can be extremely stressful, especially when notifications are switched on. More vulnerable learners are at an even greater risk. Therefore, measurements need to be put into place to promote a greater awareness of these problems. According to Santana Vega, people with unmet psychological needs have a high level of FOMO. And this can increase in adolescence since they face significant challenges and obstacles to form their identity and to gain autonomy. And such challenges are exacerbated further for young students relocating to a new city or a new country even to start a university course. So what might we consider in our teaching practice? We know there are many advantages to using mobile devices for educational purposes, but there needs to be greater understanding of how students can manage use of a device that is merging the private with the public. So some preliminary thoughts, as you can see, shifting of pedagogy, more open-mindedness to device type, digital well-being and specialist software. Let me discuss these further. <clears throat> so there is agreement that teaching pedagogy is changing, but at varying rates and more developments are needed. Teachers need to adjust to a shift in classroom control as digital learning is giving students element of control over their own time, place, pathways and pace. This should also take into consideration the ideas of boundaries when using a personal device for educational purposes. Pagram notes that teachers may well find themselves increasingly called upon to fuse pedagogical and technological understandings and to become designers of digital learning tasks and activities. And actually the TPAC framework supports this, that there is a need for teachers to develop skills in the three areas of pedagogical knowledge, content knowledge, but also technological knowledge. So on a practical note, what can we do at the moment? We could place more emphasis on, emphasis on noticing. Have you noticed any patterns of behavior in any of your classes or seminars or lectures? For me, a recent observation that I, that I took, I noted four things. So I wasn't teaching this lesson, I was, I was simply observing. I noted that, as I mentioned, some students consciously place that device down, face down, when the class is starting. Are they making a conscious decision to avoid distraction? 
The second thing I noticed is the notification. As soon as that notification flashed up on the screen, that student remained distracted for the rest of the lesson. The third thing that I noticed, as soon as the teacher started to signal that the lesson was drawing to an end, every single student looked at their phone. And the final observation that I made was that mobile phones were by far the most commonly used device in this session. Could noticing these patterns of behaviour enable us to better plan our sessions? Regarding open-mindedness, students are using a range of mobile devices for learning. Instead of covert operations with use of mobile phones in the classroom, because some teachers do find them an annoyance, maybe more openness may help to counteract any problems of misuse. The teaching of transferable skills, such as browsing effectively for research, online media, graphics, etc., needs to take into account this preference for mobile phone accessibility especially as students are interacting with a reduced screen size and especially as the smaller device seems to be the preferred device. So this is something to consider when planning classroom activities. If technology is to be used in the session, will a mobile phone suffice or should students be given forewarning to bring a larger device? Does our perception of the value of a mobile phone for educational purposes need to change? Another area for development is how we can nurture digitally responsible learners, especially in that transition from school to university. As I mentioned, research indicates the higher the degree of mobile phone addiction, the greater the likelihood that students' academic performance will decline. Could raising awareness of this issue of addiction and anxiety caused by overuse of all types of mobile devices could this encourage more responsible use amongst our learners? But the question remains, who should provide learner training on digital well-being? There are radical ideas in place, such as digital detox retreats that could be called upon to aid this. Encouraging a balance between learning both with and completely without these devices is key. And the latter is a type of digital detox in itself, a type of mobile mindfulness. Are we doing enough to encourage our students to strike that balance? Is it the responsibility of the educator or the device manufacturer? Learner analytics tools are evolving. Outlook emails recently introduced notifications telling me off for spending too much time being connected within a week. The iPhone gives a weekly report on screen time. Should such information be incorporated into study skills somehow? Some evidence suggests that proficient students can multitask while using their devices. Therefore, management of private public boundaries on a personal device may actually be clearly achievable for proficient users but clarity is needed on what defines a proficient user and how they achieve a good work-life balance. Initiatives exist which recognise that reaching a balance must be achieved in order to ensure digital well-being, but they do not seem to have implement, been implemented and this is possibly due to limited research in this area. <clears throat> The final thought is that of specialist software for the educational environment. So optional device management software may be an attractive offering for students who struggle to manage non-educational distractions on their mobile device. Lockdown software is used with bring your own device for exams, but it's also used in businesses to ensure that the users are only able to access limited resources through their device while connected at work. 
it may be worth exploring further the affordances of lockdown browsers. Many university students have willingly installed lockdown software onto their own personal devices to sit exams in a secured virtual environment. Would any of them wish to do so to focus their time in class too? Some concluding thoughts. Mobile devices, all types, can be highly beneficial in the classroom and of course outside of the classroom to continue learning. New affordances of mobile devices mean that device types are becoming less distinguished from each other. You can pretty much do the same on your tablet as you can on your phone and vice versa, but of course the size of the screen differs. A real concern is if using your personal device in the classroom is introducing these issues with boundaries. People have the power to drive technology, leading to both positive and negative societal changes. Classroom behaviours is one area of change that is worth exploring. My own hopes, as I mentioned at the start, are to conduct primary research in this area through ethnography as soon as we are able to resume face-to-face -face teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gemma. That was a really fascinating uh, presentation there, especially in the current climate with everything going on. Um, if anyone's got any questions, if they want to put them in the chat box, um, I'll pick out the one that we have from Andrea, which is, um, I just wondered if you considered any equality issues in your research. For example, are students at a disadvantage if they don't have the latest personal mobile phone? Yeah, that is a really, a really good and valid question and is definitely something that needs to be considered by institutions. So um, one of our one of our departments at Newcastle University in SNES, they provided tablets to all students on one of their courses in place of textbooks. So there are there are people who take the initiative to make sure everybody has the same device. Um, not absolutely every student wanted to use that device, some preferred to use their own. So yes, institutions must consider this and there, there must be some funding um, available for those students who are not able to afford the latest technologies, especially if they're being asked to use their own device for exams, for example. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got another question uh, which states, appreciate that your research has focused on the transition to undergraduate study from primary to secondary school experiences, but is there research looking at the additional distractions of work and education life? For example, part-time work-based PG learners and the need to stay connected to the organisation when studying. In other words, this adds a further intersector to private life and education. It absolutely does. Um, I haven't actually researched that area myself, but I have um, spoken with colleagues about this issue before. Um, myself, I'm a part-time student, I'm working full-time, so I can speak from personal experience, absolutely. And I think all of us here can now appreciate with our own remote working, how difficult it can be no matter which stage of study you're at, or whether it's that you're, that you're working from home. So this this blurring of boundary of having to bring your work into your own household gives you a sense of what those students who are trying to work and study may also be trying to balance. So I think it's a very um, hot topic at the moment. It's not something I've studied specifically, but it, there is certainly research out there. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any further questions? Um, I can either pop them in the chat box or anyone wants to be brave and ask a question on the mic we could go for that we need to see some faces <laughs> yeah if anyone wants to turn their uh, their video on um please feel free to do that also no i think everyone's a bit too shy any further questions oh here's the one uh from simon a great presentation Gemma. Uh, is reduced screen size and tendency for bite-sized learning potentially uh, potentially lead to challenges for teaching complex concepts and what are the ways around this? Absolutely, it is a concern and not only the reduced screen size but this need for speed as well. Um, 
there's a there's a bit of disconnect i think for for many um teaching staff members they need that training and they need to to learn how to um take that into consideration not absolutely every task is suitable for use with a mobile phone screen absolutely not but it takes some forethought and pre-planning from the teacher um, as i mentioned that if a more complex activity is needed and a larger screen size is needed it's worth communicating clearly with the student what what the plan is for that session or the learning outcomes for that session or the recommendation of the device that would be most suitable for that session um, definitely we, we can't we can't use mobile phones for absolutely everything um, we can't use devices for absolutely everything i think it's important that we have a blended learning approach and we're not becoming obsessed that everything has to involve technology. We have to strike a balance. Excellent, thank you very much, Gemma. Um, do you have any further questions? We've got, um, obviously the session runs until half two, so we have plenty of time if there's any more. Uh, we've got one from Jo and she asks, how can we ensure that future stakeholders, uh, such as school kids, can transition easier into higher education requirements for digital literacy? Yeah, I think there is a big gap there. As I mentioned, it, it, it almost seems like as soon as a student arrives at university, they're expected to just know how to use everything responsibly. So with this banning of, of mobile devices that I mentioned in school, they've suddenly got free reign to use any device for any reason. Um, and I think it's definitely worth exploring those induction packages that we offer at university. It's definitely worth looking at learner training packages how can we try and encourage students to be digitally responsible? Where that falls, um, you know, it remains to be seen at the moment, whether or not there's policy changes that could be made, whether or not there's an online induction package, it could be um, mapped within the, um, the library provision, for example, with the ask resources, but there's a clear gap there at the moment. Personal tutor system as well, sorry, I was going to add. Brilliant. Thank you, Gemma. Um, someone says, such a fab talk. That was Joe. Oh, thank <laughs> Thanks for answering that question. It's um, a very hot talk in this room. <laughs> I know, yeah. I think yeah, it's, it's the very hottest day of the year. So <laughs> thank you to everyone <laughs> for joining us. Um, we do have time for more questions. If anyone else wants to put something in the chat, do so now. Um, just as, as I was, as I was um, reading the question there, my phone actually went off in my pocket on... Um, <laughs> on vibrate did it uh, distract you bob <laughs> it did distract me yes yeah. so i just had to throw it throw it away um but yeah i mean in everyday life that's that's quite common isn't it i mean i try to delete my apps during the week or my social apps um and reinstall them on the weekend that's my kind of self-imposed way of doing it but um but yeah do you say there's quite a lot of um kind of uh, apps and things that kind of lock out uh, everything so you just they're able to use one program during a session or an exam so, yeah it's definitely something worth thinking about um mm. now that i'm working from home on on the computer in this room it's putting me off studying because now i can't differentiate between those two workspaces yeah it's, yeah <laughs> strange strange times <laughs> all very blurred <laughs> um, i thought i'd be brave and ask a question in person yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, Gemma, thank you. It was a really good talk. Um, whether the current situation, and I know, you know, which I think has made this so much more topical, whether you think what's happening at the moment with lockdown will kind of maybe be a bit of a catalyst to some of these policy changes and, and whether you want to say anything about that? I think it definitely should be. I'm talking to a colleague yesterday about this, actually. So if, if our teaching is to continue remotely for quite some time, I think there's a real need to um, to talk to our students about this because if they're trying to study at home or even in a different country, you know they, they're going to need support in that area. It's going to be really difficult. Maybe maybe even just the work environment is very noisy. Maybe they've got siblings or you know family members interrupting them physically. But as a teacher, you're not going to be monitoring what they're doing in this virtual classroom. You can't see if they're sort of distracted playing keeping their streaks going or playing games or whatever. Um, 
I think raising awareness of how important it is and how much of a detrimental effect some of this addictive behavior can have on their studies. I think raising awareness is really key, especially in this current climate. And also just for mental um, health purposes and switching off from screens as well, um, making sure that our learners are mentally well. Brilliant, thank you, Gemma. And thank you, Andrea, for that question. And um, we've got another one in the chat from Sandra, who's asking, who says, thank you for a very interesting presentation, which uh, she can relate to as an educator and from her own experience. And she asks, does LTDS or other resources have additional information on TPAC? I can give you additional information on TPAC. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Brilliant, well, yeah, we can um, include that um, when we send everything out. Um, but yeah, I'll just ask if there's any more uh, questions. We will send out all the slides um, and the recording of the presentation along with the, uh, the policy paper and uh, Holly will also send out a feedback form, um, which we'll uh, send out to everyone. Um, do I'll we just have any more? That. Sorry, I was just gonna add, there's quite a long list of references at the end of the PowerPoint not absolutely every reference is included because it's getting a little bit too long. <laughs> but if, if there's anything missing and you do want any additional resources, just drop me an email, I'm more than happy to share. Brilliant. That's great, thank you, Gemma. Uh, just to note that um, the next uh, new CAS is um, on the 3rd of June, which is uh, Professor David Leet. Um, it's titled A Learning City. It's about um, project-based learning. So we'll send out the links to the next sessions as well. Um, Simon's also posted in the chat to ask uh, one thing the internet has led to us having more uh, slash diverse profiles for example on multiple social media sites and with different whatsapp groups etc in the period of transition is the benefit of students developing profiles on institutional systems my learning style I think so definitely um, although interestingly in uh, as a student a couple of years ago in one of my modules interestingly students will still form those um, informal groups as well so we were we were tweeting and we were blogging in a professional capacity but students also then decide to create that less formal space um, but yeah I think it's really important for them to be able to differentiate between those two different spaces um, apps like teams it's becoming a little more casual with likes and emojis and, and gifs and things like that. Um, but I think it's still important to, to make that clear distinction between what is, what is a formal study space and what is recreation. Definitely, thank you for that, Gemma. Um, any more questions? Staring at the box to see if anything <laughs> Um, yeah, we've had quite a few questions there. So thank you, everyone. If there's no more questions, um, I see someone's given an applause. So yeah, if we can use the reaction button to give Gemma a round of applause. Um, and thank you, Gemma, for um, your presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. As I mentioned, uh, the next session for the CAS is on the 3rd of June, and we'll send out all the details uh, for that, along with all the presentation notes and slides and recordings from today. So if there's no further questions, um, just, yeah, thanks again for joining us and see you all soon. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.